This episode of The Thing You're Watching is brought to you by me. I'm in what you might call a rock band, and we've recently released what you might call a song. We'd really appreciate it if you checked it out. There's a link in the link place and up in the cards. Here's a little snippet of it. Oh, the t- That's, That's my, my little voice, voice doing that. that. Wow, well, can, can you believe, believe it? it? Anyway, let's get on with the show. Blood of my blood. Get Your Own opens right where the duh left off, with Bran totally wigging out and Mira doing all the work, am I right, ladies? She collapses under societal pressure and Bran's like, huh, we're gonna die. But then, like some kind of deus ex some kind of machina, a mysterious rider appears. He doesn't arrive, he appears. Look, in this first shot, he's not even moving. He was already there. It's obviously internet historian, but we have to pretend for now that we don't know that. He, um, lights his little orb on fire using special effects, seriously, what the fuck? And clears off this small detachment of whites. There was an army following them out the back of the cave, so I don't know how only a few managed to find them, considering that these things have been shown to operate on what basically amounts to a hive mind, but whatever. We've successfully written ourselves out of peril. Of course, the real juice in this scene is all the visions Bran has. The typical the typical purpose of displaying many supposedly disconnected images in sequence is to suggest that there is actually a connection there. I get that they're also showing us that Bran is dealing with a lot right now guys, taking in a whole bunch of information that for some reason he hadn't been learning over the past year and a half, but they have chosen to show us these specific images. It creates the effect of an overwhelming amount of information, but why this information in particular? Let's pretend it's 2016 and overanalyze these 6 seconds of footage so we can make the front page of reddit. In his visions, Bran sees the alchemists making wildfire, a dragon flying and then its shadow over King's Landing, it's probably Drogon, Aerys Targaryen's barbecue instructions, BURN THEM ALL! Bacon, burnt black. Rhaegar at hard home making some friends, himself falling from the tower in Game of Thrones, oh shit he has seen season 1, the sun rising over the raven's cave I think, Black Walder killing Catelyn, Lisa playing classical gas, Daenerys after the pyre with Drogon on her shoulder, Craster's son being carried to the weird ice fortress and then turned into the blue baby who can't collect regular heart containers, head being beneded, Mace Tyrell singing to Tycho Nestoris to absolve the crown's deaths, a dense flock of ravens flying through what looks like the haunted forest, wildfire exploding in the stores under King's Landing, Jamie doing a regicide except he's 42 instead of 19 and then he sits on the throne, young Ned asking Arthur Dane where Lyanna is, Daddy Derek's guitar signed by Van Halen, Roos killing Rob, a raven flying somewhere green. Young Ned's hand covered in blood. Leaf creating the Blue Man group. Scenes from Hard Home, including John fighting his dad's mate. His own interaction with the army of the dead from the last episode. The dead marching on the fist in the season 2 finale. And weirdly, an advertisement for established titles presented by me, Lord Glimbus. Hi. We've had some fun in this series, haven't we? But you may have noticed a ghastly trend in this show where people just assume rulership positions by simply killing the last person who held said position. I uh, did it. Now, this is all well and good if your world is governed by lazy writers and tired tropes, but here in the real world, we respect titles and certificates saying you have those titles. So if you want to be known as a lord or a lady, put down the knife I sold you last time and instead look to establish titles for your prestige having needs. Now sure, you won't be gaining control of Winterfell or Dawn or whatever, but you will gain control of at least a square foot of land in the rural hamlet of, I'm gonna say this one, Ardali in Aberdeenshire. Traditionally, the owner of an estate is referred to as a laird, which is one of them cognates with lord, so that's how this whole thing works. So, you know, tend to your land, build a castle maybe, get a few peasants, because guess what? You're a lord now. Good for you. Go do lord things. Established Titles is committed to planting a tree in the pristine, beautiful Scottish woodlands for every order. So, I don't know, go plant one yourself too. Do lords do that? Is that a lord thing? I've heard that one of them annual holidays where people are socially obliged to exchange presents is happening rather soon, so hey, go to establishedtitles.com slash Glidus and use code Glidus for a discount on a cute, fun novelty gift that someone you know is bound to appreciate. Just make sure that they're not already nobility before you get it for them, because that'd be pretty embarrassing.
and 26, a YouTube apology video. All of these visions I listed, except for the fake ones I put in to try to make you smile, and the integration to get your boy paid, are events from the past, with the notable exceptions of Drogon flying over King's Landing and the wildfire exploding under King's Landing. Given that there are no other examples of Bran or Maxi seeing the future, and Bran later flat out saying that he cannot see the future, Dragonfire will stop him. I don't know. This is weird. I guess these are both things that Eris would have had going through his head, maybe? But again, there's zero indication that deadass mind reading exists in the show, let alone the mind reading of someone who died over 20 years ago. So we're left at what the fuck is going on, because even if there were an explanation for Bran seeing things that haven't happened yet, which there isn't, there's still the galaxy sized question mark at the end of this string of flashbacks. I must stress that when you present a series of visions, it is implicit that there is a purpose behind them, a reason for connecting them. Especially so in a show that in previous seasons has established a pattern of paying off its viewers close attention to detail. Competent writers might use this opportunity to provide a satisfying experience when viewed in hindsight. Shit writers might use this opportunity to flash a bunch of random shit that trick the viewer into being intrigued, hoping that by the time the story concludes, the viewer will have forgotten about it. Which to their credit, seems to have worked. So. Kudos, Dave and Dan, and thanks for watching, by the way. Like, we've seen how the show ends, we have all the information that we're going to get about this, so you'd have to write a whole novel of insane fanfiction to somehow connect Catelyn's death to Drogon flying over King's Landing, or Leaf making the Night King to Aerys commanding the catering staff. Sure, these things could feasibly have been connected, but you would have to write the connection yourself, and that connection is likely to be so tenuous and also pretty meaningless. Of course, the reason that the writers had to rely on things there's no way Bran could have seen is that they delivered fuck all of interest in his time training under the old dude. God, it's like the laziest attempt at mystery box storytelling. Also, he's suddenly able to view the past, including things he's never seen before, without contact with the Weirwood route. Two things happen in this scene, and I hate both of them. I don't want to have to talk about Bran later, so let's talk about the next scene too. That's that's this video's structure today, baby. That that. That's how it works. Turns out that Benjen was actually Benjen the whole time, comma, what a twist. I need to be clear that I don't mind his return to the story on the whole. I'd much rather something than nothing happen here, and this is certainly something. Lots of people think Cold Hands in the book is Benjen, but there's a note in the draft of Dance where Gurm says that he isn't, but that doesn't apply to the show, even though Benjen is filling a Cold Handsy sort of role. Not that that's what I'd take issue with. I take issue with him appearing from nowhere, both physically and narratively. As in, how the fuck, and also, why the fuck, which are two the fucks you don't want grifters like me asking. Did the old guy light the raven symbol before he died? If Bran is now the three-eyed raven, You are the three-eyed raven, no. And the three-eyed raven is in charge of Benjen, Three-eyed raven sent for me. Then why does Bran not know what the fuck's going on with Benjen? Who are you? This leads into the much larger issue of what the fuck is going on. Our third the fuck now, for those of you counting along at home. The story makes such a big deal of Bran becoming the Three-Eyed Raven without ever at all establishing what that means beyond the most vague of explanations. It's difficult to explain. Such a half-assed attempt at implementing this idea into the story. Actually, half is too generous. They quarter-assed it. Even though this opportunity right here is fucking perfect, like tailor-made for naturally expositing about these things, things. Imagine if instead of Uncle Benjamin. Bran said, you're Benjen Stark, which would instantly communicate Bran's lack of personality and connection to his previous self. Or better yet, he could simply wake up and instead of asking who he is, he could already know and tell Mira because he's the Three-Eyed Raven and he now knows what the Three-Eyed Raven knows, which would tie in with the bullshit montage at the start of the episode. Having Bran ask who Benjen is and then declare his personal relationship to Benjen fundamentally contradicts the previous fucking line. Three Red Raven sent for me. If Red Raven's dead. Now he lives again. But rather than communicating anything about the biggest change that this main character has ever undergone, the scene chooses to instead tell us that Benjen was saved by the children with Dragonglass to the heart, reinforcing that thing Bran learnt last episode, thus making it really seem like something that's gonna mean anything? We already knew that the Dragonglass kills White Walkers, we'd known that for three years at this point. We already knew that the children made the walkers like this and 
and the children are now extinct, so they're not going to be impacting shit. And having seen the rest of this show, this winds up meaning fucking nothing. For some reason, when they did this to Rhaegar, he became the blue dude, but when they did it to Benjin, he didn't change much and just became Alt Swift X. So I don't know what the fuck's going on here with the dragon glass in the heart. It kind of feels like they're hammering a nail that was already in all the way, and they didn't need it in the first place. So in summation, this scene was an incredible opportunity to enrich the story in the world by letting Benjin tell us about the Three-Eyed Raven and the White Walkers and to deepen a character and a recent plot point by solidifying Bran as detached and robotic. Thinking about that, this scene could have actually been shocking and thrilling and so memorable. Instead though, they chose to uh, do, do none of that and as a result, I entirely forgot about this scene until watching this episode through for the video. Uh oh! Hey look, the show finally made it to the reach, how about that? There is no way around it. Gilly is so cute. It's so green. Okay, to catch you up, Sam has decided that the man who sent his firstborn son to spend the rest of his life in duty-bound misery under punishment of death is going to accept a strange low-born woman and her three-year-old newborn into his house because they are family. Like sure, Ranwell's treatment of Sam Dill was informed by his expectations of his heir, but wouldn't you then figure that he would also have similarly restrictive expectations of a woman that Gilly isn't so likely to fulfill? Sam also neglected to mention to his girlfriend who he loves that his father and also everyone else is like obscenely mega racist until minutes before they arrived. Except for his mum because she's so nice, aww. And the plan is that rootin' tootin' racist Randy is gonna be fine with Gilly and little Sam Bone hanging around even with Sam leaving for Old Town. My point is that knowing Randall, Sam should never have even considered this as an option. Literally all we have learnt about this man prior to this point is that Stannis considers him to be an excellent commander and that he's a massive fuckwit who threatened to murder his son because he didn't like the way he acted. Sam's entire story over the previous three seasons was about developing courage for defending his loved ones. When you're nothing at all, there's no more reason to be afraid. But you're afraid now. I'm not nothing anymore. So his voluntary plan to sheepishly hand off his girlfriend and adopted son to this walking pile of human excrement and shit when faced with the hardship of finding a place in Old Town is just silly. Now, Blug of My Glug's story is that he develops the courage to cowardly leave Horn Hill in the night without confronting his father after he asks him to leave, also stealing his shit. All in all, this entire escapade to Horn Hill kinda just feels like a way to introduce Randall and get another Valyrian steel sword into the hands of a main character, which I count as absolutely not worth this headache of a plan from Sam. I guess it gives Sam a moment of revenge against his father by taking a thing of which we have only just now heard, which ends up affecting nothing, so that's great thanks for that. Maybe it wouldn't have been quite so stupid if going to Horn Hill was Gilly's idea in the first place, having never met Randall, but as it is, it's such a strange and illogical pit stop on the way to Old Town. If he claims that this 30 year old man is his son, Sam is admitting to breaking his oaths to the Night's Watch and is therefore returning home, returning to his father as the same useless fat craven he was when he left, except now he's failed at something Randall considers to be very lowly. And he thinks this is going to work. So it's probably a good subject to avoid. Sam do you know how long it takes to become a maester? It's not like Gilly's going to be staying at Horn Hill for two weeks while you attend a seminar. This is not a summer camp. This is going to take years. Eamon studied at the Citadel for a decade. Do you think Gilly's lack of experience living south of the Walrus isn't going to come up in that amount of time? It literally happens in the very first interaction she has with Randall. Sam is supposed to be not a moron, yet he thinks that Gilly can maintain the secret of her entire identity for years. Can you help me kill myself? And he didn't tell her this was going to be an issue until they were in the fucking driveway. Again, this is only fine if Sam is supposed to be comically stupid. I love books. Anyway, Sam talks about trees and I like trees, so this is good dialogue. Maple, elm, beech. Poplar. The odd willow. Gilly shows herself to be quick and kinda clever with words, which leaves room for a message about education or some shit, but if you'll recall, this character never gets a conclusion beyond becomes pregnant. Didn't think I'd ever come back here after my father made me renounce my title and inheritance and well, threatened to kill me if I didn't. Yep, coming back here seems like something you would try very hard not to do. The person just doesn't feel welcome at that point. You fucking pancake. They arrive at the fortified Roman villa
below of Horn Hill, and yep, the Tallies are cute, and it's both logical and funny to see Tala's wildly different priorities, outlooks, and concerns. Father says I have to marry Simon Fossaway. Considering where Sam and Gilly have come from. Melissa is also cute, and her dynamic with Randall is something we don't really get elsewhere in the show. A sweet, genuine, kind lady standing up to her calloused asshole husband. Oh, and I would be remiss to not mention the missed opportunity of having Sam bump into Arya in Bravos. There's a public play central to Arya's plot at the moment, so that could have been a cool place to throw them together. As in the books, Bravos is a perfectly logical port to make a stop at. And speaking of ports, how did they even get to Horn Hill? What port would they have docked at other than Old Town? Mostly deer, or is it elk as well? You foolish fictional character, you. Elk refers to either this thing or this thing, depending on what day of the week it is, and both of them are species of deer. This is like saying, mostly fruit, or rather apples too. Stay tuned for more taxonomy review. I really do like Sam's sister and Sam's mum. Sam's mum. This little bit where she tells a story about meeting the great John is nice, just in the way she delivers it. We once met a man, Lord Umber from Last Hearth, wasn't it, Randall? You didn't meet him? Uh, no, I, but I know. You were in the kitchen? So I was. <laughs> Sam's fucking dumb and tells his dad that Gilly is good at hunting right after saying that you need to be good at hunting north of the wall. So it's probably a good subject to avoid. So let's say your son, who you threatened to murder for being a fat, useless screw-up, comes back home as an oath-breaker in addition to a fat, useless screw-up. He's fathered a bastard and brought a wildling into your home. A wildling who is totally pulling off your daughter's dress, by the way. Now, you're a macho fuckass obsessed with restrictive notions of masculinity. Society expects you to act with honour, and you want to keep your wife happy, so you take in the girl and the baby. But your son, who has insulted your honour, not just in this instance, but also for his entire life, who you, and I must emphasize this, threatened to end the life of and banished to the end of the world simply because he didn't live up to your standards. What punishment do you bestow upon him? And this will be the last night you ever spend at Horn Hill. <sighs> Well, at least I bet he'll do something drastic once he finds out that Sam stole his family's priceless epic sword heirloom. Won't he come for it? He can bloody well try. Remember that time I said season 6 sets up so much awesome sounding shit that never eventuates at all ever? Yeah, this is like the most obvious example. And considering that Heartsbane's fate is to be simply handed to Jorah after he decided to not claim Longclaw, only to not be used for anything significant, I kind of have to wonder what the point was at all. This scene's ultimate effect is setting up some incredibly minor payoff for when Sam meets Jorah for the second time. Get your things. I don't have any things. Garbage as this whole sequence is, I can't help but love this. And yeah, it's a simple, obvious joke, but it fits for the character. I think I'm done talking about Horn Hill now. Uh, James Faulkner has a great voice. Oh, and Tala wants Randall to be more like Craster. I think our father could learn a thing or two from your father. I am a godly man! Okay, let's move on. I always wanted to be a potato! potato. Wow! Over in King's Landing... <laughs> oh no! The plot is threatening to go somewhere! Let's see if our characters can prevent this from happening. You see, Marjorie's nudist parade is fast approaching, and knowing how much literally everyone in the audience would enjoy that, the writers move heaven and earth to stop it. Biggest blue balls in television history. Tom is worried about his wife, Simp, and old Frankie throws him a bone not like that because he thinks letting Tom and see Marjorie will help him achieve the ultimate goal of confusing the audience. Nah, like, I know that he's doing this to use her to bring the king into the faith, as we see later, but it's just weird that it's this declaration thing like, hey, Tommen is in the faith now. Because what does that even mean? He confided in the High Sparrow several times before now, he's followed this faith his entire life, and what happens here doesn't seem to change anything mechanically, so it's tough to see what actually changed hands in this plot this episode. The homeless Pope later announces an alliance between the Crown and the faith, so what the heck is that all about? What control or power does he now have that he didn't previously have? Seven episodes ago, he was able to humiliate and emaciate Cersei, the king's mother, the matriarch of the most powerful family in the kingdom, with absolute impunity. I guess now he has Tommen's promise that he won't get in his way? Yeah, because Tommen was such an obstacle up until now. And yet, Olena says, He's beaten us. And it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? You still have an army at his footstep and a horse that can climb stairs like they're nothing to him. There's nothing stopping you from doing what you were going to do. Sure, the announcement of no walk of atonement for the beloved queen Marjorie puts the public on the faith side, I guess. But since when has anybody given the teeniest, tiniest, most minuscule little crumb of a fuck about the 
public. And it can't be about hurting Tommen or his reputation or his ego because if that was a concern, then they wouldn't have planned it in the first place. And beyond plot issues, this, and I'll need as many air quotes as I can get my hands on for this one, development is also a Chuck Norris roundhouse kick to the audience's balls or lack of balls. Now, this is Game of Thrones, so on a basic level, we want and expect the plot to surprise us. We were told that there was going to be a show of force to resolve this conflict, and then there wasn't one. So yeah, they've satisfied the audience's expectation of a twist, but the twist is that nothing fucking happens. Tom and being on side with Franklin would be twist enough if he weren't so vacillating before now, and you can still make a twist from the conflict. As it is, Jamie is dismissed from the Kingsguard for simply riding up some stairs on a wonder steed. No, I will never get over how ridiculous this is, and also because Tommen knows he needs to get to Riverrun for the Brienne scene. Like Tommo says, When you attack the faith, you attack the crown. Anyone who attacks the crown is unfit to serve as Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Uh, but, but you know, he didn't actually attack the faith, did he now, Sonny Jim Malad? There are subtle allusions here to Barristan's dismissal, which is nice. I would have liked a bit more direct mirroring, but whatever. It's probably a good thing that Jamie's being dismissed from the Kingsguard, though, given that when executing what was supposed to be a violent coup, he didn't know where the king was. You know, his son. Nor did he know where the rest of the Kingsguard were. You know, his subordinates. Jamie wants to stay and make heads roll, but Cersei again tells him that that just won't work because he'll die in the process. Okay, so just have Bronn do it. I'm going to give Bronn the largest bag of gold anyone has ever seen. And have him gather the best killers he knows. Like, Jamie does not have to be a part of this. You can't just suggest a valid idea and then have another character shoot it down with an easily dismissible statement. I like that Jamie's instinct is to solve the problem with money and violence, very Tywin of him, but it does make me wonder what gold he would fill this bag with, given that Castle Rock has run dry. Anyone keeping tabs on that? Hey Cersei, did you know that Sansa is alive and Peter has an army parked at Moat Caelan? Has anyone informed you that Tyrion is in charge of Marie? Oh, but yeah, nah, definitely sort out Walder Frey's stalemate at River Run. Yeah, that is definitely the issue in most in need of your attention. Show them what Lannisters are what we do to our enemies. I feel like this could be accomplished pretty well by murdering the sparrows with swords. Okay, so I've done a lot of complaining and sometimes strange people bitch about how I couldn't have written anything better. I could solve this problem by not reading comments, but I think instead I'll just suggest an alternative plot. Okay, so for whatever reason, you've decided that Jamie needs to go to Riverrun this season, but his character obviously has no reason to want to leave King's Landing at this point, so we need to force him out. At the same time, we've got this conflict brewing between him and the High Sparrow. Jamie has talked about solving this problem by killing people quite a few times now. What atonement do I deserve? They should be closer if you mean for them to save you. So tell him to march into the Sept and crush the High Sparrow's head like a melon. And he's got this plan where he's gonna threaten to kill people to solve the problem. When the High Sparrow's in custody, or dead preferably, so, I don't fucking know. Maybe instead of Tommen stretching the truth like it owes him money. Anyone who attacks the crown is unfit to serve as Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. You could actually have Jamie just get sick of all this shit and start killing people. Maybe give the High Sparrow a henchman for us to become familiar with who Jamie attacks. And, oh, hi Lancel. See, they kind of even eye each other off. Okay, maybe not that because kinslaying is a big deal sometimes. I did. And we don't want to make Jamie a kinslay. Oh, bye Alton. I don't know man, Jamie lost his daughter because Alaria wasn't punished severely enough and he's been talking about murdering these dudes all season. So just have him fucking do it. He's fed up and he's taking things into his own hands because he's seen what happens when he doesn't. You know what? He doesn't even have to kill anyone. Just start the fighting to give some payoff to all this posturing earlier. This would actually demonstrate that violence won't work against the Sparrows and give a more legitimate reason for kicking him out of the city. I think it'd be cool if he chose to go to Riveron of his own volition once he heard Brienne was going there and learned for himself how to solve an issue without violence, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to that particular abyssal more. And if you're gonna say that I have an unfair advantage over Benioff and Weiss, thanks again for watching, because I'm riding with the benefit of hindsight, that's what a fucking draft is for. Anyway, I interrupted myself a few times there, back to this scene. Marjorie deconstructs the way she previously treated the poor, humanitarianism for the sole sake of appearances, that kind of shit, and you know, yeah, that's a thing you can write about, no worries. 
series, it's a bit reductive because back in season three, it seemed as though Marjorie was genuinely invested in the well-being of the poor, but now she's saying that it was entirely self-serving. And sure, she wasn't like instituting a universal basic income, but thirdly, that's not a thing in this world. Secondly, she never had the power to do that. And firstly, she was using what power she did have to implement systemic change that would benefit the poor, you know? Change that was fought against by existing powers. So that's annoying, but it's all moot if we surmise that Marjorie is pulling a fast one here, trying to convince Tommen to do what Uncle Religion wants to do so that she can get her family out of this bullshit. But then that's also moot because of course... <laughs> So any potential point about Marjorie's self-perception is blown up along with the rest of all the great stories that could be told in this city. It's strange that upon his recusement from the Kingsguard, Jamie doesn't assume the position of Lord of Casterly Rock. I'm sure it's fine in the care of whoever the fuck is there at the moment. God, Jamie's dismissal should be such a big moment. Being Kingsguard is such a core piece of his identity. The oaths that bind him to the Order have plagued his mind for over half his life, and now he's suddenly free of them and this part of his understanding of himself has instantly vanished. There are so many things you could do with a character in this circumstance. I could go into them here, but it would hardly be worth it, so all I'll do is the same thing I did with John's death. Pretend that this scene never happened, that instead Tommen simply commanded Jamie to go deal with Riverrun, changing nothing about the Kingsguard. Thinking through to the end of the show, does anything of note change if this never happened? Yeah, nah. That's how you know it was wasted, in spite of the immense potential. As with so many many other scenes, the dialogue itself is fine, the content I guess is technically coherent, it's just constantly blundering in terms of character and plot. You know, I haven't really taken the chance to talk about the Ace of Roses himself yet. Certainly a minor character, but there's still a handful of things to discuss, like uh, his fancy helmet. Thank the gods for Mace Tyrell's fancy helmet. The show needs more fancy helmets like Mace Tyrell's fancy helmet. I want to know who designed Mace Tyrell's fancy helmet. I did. Nah, we like Mace here. Back at the thing I said was good last time, it's still good, but suffers from a bit of sameness, you know, being the same thing as it was last time. I always thought it was a bit strange of Izimbaro to end the play with Tywin's death, but we'll hear what he thinks of criticisms like mine a bit later. This act of the play is basically retelling season 4, which of course concludes with Arya travelling across the narrow sea to Bravos, where she ends up murdering people. So it's funny that the bloody hand ends with Tyrion threatening to travel across the narrow sea to potentially murder people in Bravos. Not haha funny, or any other kind of funny, really. Again, it's great to see Arya's perception of Cersei change due to Crane's performance, not that this manifests significantly in any way. Like, in just a few episodes time, she declares her intention to murder Cersei, which she's expressed interest in doing, like, fucking ages ago. Isn't it funny that Arya rebels against the Faceless Men and denounces their cult and embraces her own identity only to basically become one of them anyway? Not Haha, <laughs> funny. I guess big picture it could be a story about the lasting effects of trauma, but we all know that that's not how this plays out. <laughs> She's so cool! Again, this is a case of season 6 presenting a wonderful opportunity to complexly evolve one of its main characters, toying with that idea, promising something going forward, and then failing to deliver. She learned how to murder only the people she wants to murder. Great! Crane could be the window into the humanity of Arya's enemies that she needs to realise that violence and vengeance are not the answer. I don't claim to be a thematic or analytical mastermind, but I think it should be pretty obvious to anyone who's read A Song of Ice and Fire that the author isn't all that keen on cycles of violence as a method of problem solving. And so for Aya to be venerated as a hero... For Aya Stark, the hero of Winterfell. Yeah! For the violent emissary of death who rejected her humanity and allows vengeance to govern her actions to be extolled as the saviour of mankind, well, it's pretty insulting on a basic fucking level. It's also just so frustrating that they wrote in a beat that would perfectly act as the catalyst for a change in Arya's heart, only to then double down on her murderous intentions. Which again, would have been fine if they wanted to portray Arya's story as a tragedy about the ways the horrors of war transform people. But yeah, nah, she's the saviour of humanity. Sorry for going big picture so often, it's kind of necessary to articulate the problems I have with this season. But to be fair to myself, which I always like to be, the writing's no good. You said it, Lady Kranados. You said it. 
You have no right to an opinion. Now, this is obviously the greatest line ever spoken in any television program, and I'm astounded it hasn't caught on as a shitty reaction gif with the garbage frame rate used by dumbasses on Twitter who don't have the guts to defend their awful takes. It's just so good. Just getting my praise for it and Richard E. Grant's delivery out of the way before throwing a hissy fit about it. Guys. This is so fucking petty. And I don't care if it's tongue in cheek or they didn't mean it when they wrote this rant where a writer goes off at an actor for suggesting ideas or even vaguely criticizing the material they have to work with. Isn't Baro isn't portrayed as exactly sympathetic, but you know, nobody in the scene deflates his ideas and the tone is pretty serious, so I don't know, man. It's just that given your track record, I think it's pretty unprofessional and kind of garbage of you to say something like this. David, Daniel, who is still watching, thanks so much, Make sure you subscribe. Who's anyone to judge my work? This is my profession. I know what I'm doing. There's two possibilities here, the way I see it. Either they're making fun of themselves and other self-righteous, egotistical, do-no-wrong writers who think their farts smell like freshly mowed grass, in which case, like, stop being those things. It's either that, or the rant is intended to be taken at face value, in which case, I mean, you're just a shit-scented candle, right? As firm and moist as Tom Cruise after a hot bath. Anyway, the waifu was watching the whole time, turns out. Wow, I love it when this character shows up, she's my favourite. Jack and's buttering toast or some shit when the waif reports to him. Hearing that his new recruit failed during her probation period, Jacken chooses to blame Arya instead of his arcane and singularly batshit training methods. Shame. The girl had many gifts. She was so good at never following instructions. And he gives the manager permission to kill her. Classic. Oh, thank God. It's mad to think that Walder Frey hasn't been seen since the season 3 finale. So good to see David Bradley again. I hear it in my sleep! What a legend. I love you, Dad. Gay. Between himself, Benjamin, and Edmure, boob of my boob likes showing you people you haven't seen in a while. Not the most exhilarating of observations, I'll admit. Anyway, we learn a little bit about the Jamie Brienne scene they're setting up. Wait, I mean the Siege of Riverrun. Blackwalder and Lothar get dunked on in a battle of wits before the old weasel reveals that HBO still has Tobias Menzies under contract. It's pretty strange to have a grand reveal to your household of the prisoner you've been holding on to for almost three years, presumably in your household. Like the scene is constructed around this dramatic reveal, but when you think about it, shouldn't Lothar and Blackwalder already be well aware of Edmure and the potential bargaining power they therefore have? over the blackfish. Walder says that Edmure's going home, so that says to me that he's been in the twins the whole time. We learn that the other Riverlords are rising up against Frey rule, which does help to explain the blackfish's conquest of Riveron, but... We've got ten times as many men as the damn blackfish. The Malisters have risen against us. Walder having confidence in his knowledge of the size of the Blackfish's army says to me that the Malisters rising up is a new development. Walder is adamant that the Blackfish will yield because they have Edmure, which should be true but it isn't because the cool old man is too cool and old and manly to care about the future of his house. <clears throat> you ever meet a man with 99 potatoes? Danny and the entire culture that pledged loyalty to her after she desecrated their holy site are wandering through Spain. And Dario. Dario also. Danny's thinking about logistics because she hasn't been told that they don't matter in this show. Her boy toy surmises that she'll need like a thousand ships, which is funny because that's how many Euron said he'd be making. Hmm, weird how that happens. Build me a thousand ships. A thousand ships, easily. Hmm, suspicious. Dario continues being likable and not bad by pointing out that Danny wasn't made for governing. I mean, she did kind of suck at it. Then she fucks in an offward direction. God knows how much time passes before Dario gets sick of waiting and decides to go find her, and literally that instant she shows up with one of them lizardy things. So I don't know if the implication is that Danny burning something important down has somehow endeared her to Drogon, or if this is supposed to come off as completely fucking random. Either way, it's really weirdly paced. Like there's hardly any indication of the passage of time, so for comedic purposes I'm forced to assume that Dario and the horse boys waited here for four weeks while Danny inspected her hunch about where Drogon might be. I just think I think it'd be better if there was more time between these things. Maybe splitting them up with a different scene between them would be better. Or at least just give us something. Because as is, Danny looks at a mountain and decides to abandon everyone with no explanation. Wait here. Also, where the fuck is the horse when she comes back? Please don't tell me the dragon ate the horse. Finally, this season of the dragon show lives up to its name. They do the shadow shot, the soaring shot, the roaring shot, they play the cello motif super loud, and Daenerys yells about herself a bit. The affirmation of the Dothraki's loyalty to her falls 
falls a little flat given the last thing that happened with them. Like, yeah, no duh, they're gonna fight for her. So that's a little empty emotionally. I enjoy that they framed the speech around Drogo's promise in You Win or You Die, though it does ultimately serve to remind me how much better Momoa was at speaking Dothraki and how much better written that season was. Daenerys names the entire Dothraki army her Blood Riders, which for me is the height of season 6's implicit plot points or pieces of lore that are completely ignored immediately after being established. It's like the writers knew that the audience would respond to the word Blood Rider, but they didn't want to actually do anything with it because there was no point in making any of the Dothraki genuine characters at this point. What I'm saying is that as Danny's Blood Riders, they should have all wanted to murder Jon in the finale, and they didn't. So yeah, not only is the speech kind of weird pacing wise, it also retreads the same ground as a few other Danny empowerment speeches. It doesn't really accomplish anything plot wise aside from promising something that I can say with utmost certainty the writers never even considered delivering upon. And honestly the dragon doesn't even look that great. Maybe in 2016 it looked pretty good but maybe it didn't. I don't care enough to research what people thought of CGI at the time. So yeah, good scene guys, great work, thanks for watching my video. Hmm, I wonder if my dragon is behind this rock. Oh god it's Lizzie again! <sighs> Fuck me, man. The biggest problem with this episode is that it's really fucking boring. That's honestly part of why this video took so long to make. Maybe Sam taking Heartsbane or the twist in King's Landing was exciting the first time I saw it, but now, knowing what happens, it's just so fucking empty. Blood of My Blood is mostly a slow setup installment, which makes sense given the high octane action of the previous one. Woo! But an episode where fuck all happens is predictably a poor fit with season 6's already meandering garden path plot, particularly in King's Landing. Seeing Horn Hill is nice and I like the bloody hand. James Faulkner and David Bradley are wonderful to listen to, but they aren't willing to pay Tobias Menzies enough to speak, so that's an L. I think I just hate anything further east than Bravos at this point, and most things west of it. Even though it's nauseating, I still think that the John plot carries the most weight this season, and you really do feel its absence in this episode. Barely anything actually actually happens in the Daenerys plot, which still feels like it's aftermathing from episode 4, a story so slow paced it'd probably frustrate snails in traffic. The main movers in Blech of My Blech are Samwell, the High Sparrow, and fucking Benjen, so you can't be too surprised that I had trouble finding the will to write about it. Anyway, make sure you listen to my single, there's a lot more where that came from, oh boy how exciting, we're called Materia, and it's kind of like a newfangled classic rock outfit, but instead of the regular guitar and bass, we have a electric mandolin and electric violin if that sounds interesting to you. I'm the singer but I'm also learning to play piano. Again, links are everywhere. Also, while I have you, Dave, Dan, everyone else, if you want to listen to my old theory streams, I've uploaded them to me second channel because YouTube is weird with keeping VODs on main channels. So that's where they're gonna go. Lastly, I complain about this a lot on Twitter and in the Discord but I haven't mentioned it on YouTube for a while so here we go. Even though these videos are so obviously fair use, they tend to get copyright claims and because this website is built by dummies for dummies, billion dollar production companies have unchecked power over little old Cumulo Glimbus, so HBO can just say, hmm, no, you don't make any money this month. My videos take a long time and a lot of work to produce, and I'd love to work on them full time, but when every other video gets a claim, it's just not possible. That's why I'm willing to take sponsorships, but my main safety net for when I get Susaned is Patreon pledges. I'm not saying this to get you to donate, I'm just saying it to voice my deep gratitude for those who do. All of you, not just the top tier ones, who I will now list off in shockingly non-alphabetic fashion. Yen, Agla here. Undi, Stay78, Ingvold, Hoveron, Hail the Orange, Waffle, More Moths, Simcoe, Lord Org, Aviator, Nurse Ratchet, STL Guna, Shrimper Jr., Richard, Jamez, Joshy Boy, Polly, Dylan, One Inch Walrus, Magnus, and Galactic Archive. Thank you. Did you see that redirect from Garrett? Holy shit, how good was Lan? Fool to the tits with ideas!